dreaming is a venture capitalist. <laughs> it's investing our time and its resources in all sorts of possibilities, most of which might not pay off. Bob, it's great to see you. Uh, I checked uh, the last time we spoke was uh, in Boston. Uh, it was October of 2011. So we're heading up on our decade. And I'm really fascinated to see what has happened in, in sleep and dream research since. I enjoyed our conversation then. And I have to tell you, I loved your book, uh, When Brains Dream, Exploring the Science and Mystery of Sleep. Uh, Unfortunately, I have uh, missed a lot of sleep because I, uh, I was reading it the last few days. But how long have you been working on the book? Well, Tony Dodger and I, uh, we've been working on it. It probably started out two and a half years ago. Mm -hmm. And of course, nowadays with the publishing industry, they want, they want copy edited version almost a year before they go to press. So the book was really done almost a full year ago. But we spent, we spent a full year and a half writing it as well. Good. So what I'd like to do is I, you know, have this book in, embedded in me, and it's hard to be able to organize it. But let's let's try to do it in a in a systematic way, and we're going to focus on dreams for sure. Um, but let's start with the milieu in which dreams take place, and then first of all talk about sleep. So uh, let's start with kind of the basic stuff about the stages of sleep. And particularly, what have we learned about them in recent years? Sure. So while it might feel like when you're asleep, you're just asleep, you're actually going through a series of different sleep stages. It's about a 90 minute cycle. You start with waking and then you go into deeper and deeper sleep for about a half hour, 45 minutes. And then your sleep starts to lighten and you come up to lighter sleep. And after about 90 minutes, you go into what we call REM sleep or rapid eye movement sleep. And that's the state where our dreams are most intense, most bizarre, most visual, most emotional. And we stay in REM sleep and then we cycle down again. And we have this 90 minute cycle all night long where we're going in and out of REM sleep into deeper non-REM sleep up into REM sleep. And as the night progresses, we spend less of each cycle in that deep non-REM sleep and more of it in REM. So while we've got this 90 minute cycle, it's really marching towards more and more REM sleep. Mm. Um, they differ in a number of ways. They differ physiologically in terms of the brain activity. Um, if you're recording the EEG from the scalp, measuring the brain activity, you see these waves of oscillating activity in, in occurring in the brain, which are very slow. Uh, when you're in non-REM sleep and then get faster and faster until you're in REM sleep where you actually can't even see them anymore. So the brain becomes much more desynchronized. It's more like when we're awake, when we're in REM sleep. Um, other things change as well. There's a lot of neuromodulators in the brain. There's noradrenaline, there's serotonin, there's acetylcholine and dopamine, uh, which really sort of run the program that's being implemented in your brain at any given moment. It's the same hardware all the time. But these neuromodulators sort of say, are we being focused? Are we letting our attention wander? Uh, what's going on? And those change from, from sleep stage to sleep stage so that when you go into REM sleep, the release of serotonin and the release of norepinephrine, noradrenaline is completely shut off. So you go into a very different neurochemical milieu where only the acetylcholine seems to be high. And so that seems to help us process memories more effectively. So roughly in a given night's sleep, what percentage of time are we in REM? So we spend about 20% of the night in REM sleep. Children spend more, infants spend hugely more, up to two thirds of their night in REM. But basically once we hit adolescence, we're spending 20% of our night in REM, 20% in the deeper stages of non-REM sleep and a full 60% in sort of light non-REM sleep. Okay, of the non-REM sleep, um, 
uh, which is 80 percent, 20 percent deep, 60 percent, uh, you've divided into what you call N1, N2, and N3 different stages. And, and they're more than just um, uh, specified that there are different physiological functions. Uh, how deep can we understand those differences? The, the difference, well, first of all, the three stages, the division between those three stages is somewhat arbitrary. REM sleep is a, is a qualitatively different state of sleep than non-REM. And we sort of draw lines um, between the different stages of non-REM depending on how much of the time uh, in any given minute we spend with really slow oscillations in the brain. Uh, we don't know a lot about the function of these different stages. We know that uh, children growing up release most of their growth hormone during N3, the, the deepest stage of, of non-REM sleep. And, and we know that for memory processing during the night, um, a lot of our processing of, of facts that we learn during the day, um, that that information tends to be strengthened and, and solidified during N3 sleep or other types of, of learning, like procedural learning of how to do things or motor tasks or visual tasks tend to be more correlated with the amount of time we spend in N2 sleep. Mm. N1 only comes on as we're just falling asleep and it's only two or three minutes long. Yeah. And when we talk about dream function, we can come back and talk about what N1 is doing. Okay. All right, let's uh, go into now, we know the stages of, of sleep. Let's go into the physiological um, purposes of sleep. Uh, when people first started uh, thinking about sleep, uh, they just thought it was just rest. Uh, but as we've learned more, there are some very distinct physiological uh, activities going on. So let's articulate those and then we'll go on to dreams. Okay, so physiological functions of sleep. What you call when housekeeping, we... housekeeping, <laughs> housekeeping. So some of them, some of them are housekeeping. It turns out that uh, we do a lot of processing uh, of immunological uh, systems, of hormonal systems. So we know, for example, and this is particularly relevant in the COVID era, that if we sleep the private subject after they've received, say, an influenza vaccination, and then look at how much antibody they're producing two weeks later, it's reduced 50% if they don't sleep the night after they receive the vaccination. Wow. Wow. So you really need that sleep afterwards. And you need it before too. They get the same sorts of results if they just restrict people to four hours of sleep a night for four or five nights before the immunization. Again, you get almost a 50% reduction in how much antibody you produce. And that's really the difference in many cases between being functionally immunized and not. Yeah, I've had the experience in life where if I feel like I'm getting sick or getting a cold uh, and I go to sleep and, and sleep a long time, in many cases, not all, I can avoid that. And, you know, I've always wondered, is, is that an old wives' tale or psychosomatic? But it might be psychosomatic, not in the placebo sense, but in the real sense of your mind really affecting how antibodies are, are formed. Yes, and it's... We don't know what that mechanism is. We don't know how sleep is enhancing that, but it clearly does. And of course, as everybody knows if they stop and think about it, when you get a cold, there is this overwhelming drive um, to sleep. And in fact, one of the best known somnogens, uh, chemical substances that can tend to push you into sleep is the breakdown products of bacterial cell walls. So if you get a bacterial infection, your brain notices that and it tries to get you to sleep more. So not only is it helpful, but your brain knows that and tries to push you into that state. You've also talked about uh, growth hormone being um, amplified during sleep. And in fact, you have some statistic where just uh, in children, very large growth can occur measurable in, in just one or two nights. Is that right? You can grow close to a quarter of an inch overnight. That's unbelievable. That can, you know, when they first came up with this measurement and it was a nurse who did it because the doctors all thought they knew better, but she actually saw kids a lot. Yeah. Um, 
when they stop to think about it, if you take each spinal segment, each spinal bone, there's a growth plate at the top and the bottom of that segment, that spinal segment. And if each of those growth plates does one cell division, gets one cell thicker, mm. and you do that for the whole length of your spine, it's somewhere between an eighth and a quarter of the inch and of an inch. And so, yes, when 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 parents say to their kids, "You're bigger than you were yesterday," <laughs> that can literally be true. Wow, that that's amazing. Uh, and, what else? and something like eighty percent of that growth hormone that's driving that cell division, that growth is released during um, those stage, those times when you're in that deepest M3 sleep. Mm. And so it's differentiated even between the, the, the different um, segments of non-REM sleep, not just between REM sleep and non-REM sleep. That's right, that's right. It's that deep M3 sleep that seems to be pushing the release of growth hormone. How about the physiological process of uh, memory consolidation? Uh, well, that's you know that's my that, that's my my life story. That's my life work now. Um, it turns out that the entire time we're asleep, our brain is processing the memories from our day. What I like to tell people is that evolution has calculated that for every two hours we spend awake taking in new information. It has to go offline for an hour so it can just step back and look at that information and figure out, if you will, what it means. It's very easy to record something. It's very hard to figure out whether it's worth keeping, how it should be kept, where it should be stored, and in essence, what it means. And that's what the brain is doing all night long. It's taking memories and stabilizing them. It's making them stronger so that you can, for example, do some task you learned the night before faster, more efficiently in the morning than you could in the evening before you went to bed. It'll take an emotional memory and strip out all the background images in the scene and just hold the memory for the emotional core of that event. If you're taking in a lot of related information, it will take that information and it'll look for patterns It'll extract gist from it. It can hold on to the gist and forget the detail. Or if there is some sort of pattern in the data, it can discover that or the rules that control it. All of this is happening while we sleep. And much of this, it doesn't seem to be able to do while we're awake. Well, that sounds like a great story, but uh, you know, as a former neuroscientist myself, I've, I've got to ask you, give me an experimental design that can back up what you just said. Okay, let's take a simple task. Typing with your left hand up on the keys, the sequence four, one, three, two, four. Okay. It's sort of an ugly sequence that goes back and forth. We'll have a subject type that as quickly and accurately as they can for 30 seconds. Rest for 30 seconds, do it again for a total of 12 repetitions. Most people, especially if you take like college students, They'll start off somewhere around 18 in the first 30 seconds. They'll type it successfully 18 times. Then after just three or four trials, they'll be up around 23 or 24. And at the end of the 12, they will plateau maybe at 26. We do that in the morning. We say, thanks, see you later. We send them home. They come back that evening, 12 hours later. We sit them down, they have, we have them do just two 30 second trials. And where are they? They're at 24, right where they ended when they finished training that morning. If we flip the time scale, if we train them in the evening, they still start at 16, they still train up to about 24 at the end. They come back the next morning and right off the bat, they're 15 to 20% faster. Wow. Okay, now maybe that's not sleep. Maybe that has to do with just the night, but we can repeat this in a nap paradigm. We can train them at 10 in the morning, test them at three in the afternoon, and give half of them a 90 minute nap. And the ones that get the 90 minute nap will again be 15 to 20% faster at 3 p.m. The ones who don't nap will be exactly where they were at the end of training. 
And if we look at the sleep, especially with the overnight study, we'll find that the amount of time they spend in N2 sleep late in the night is highly predictive of the overnight improvement. In fact, it explains 50% of the variance in how much improvement people show. Okay, uh, just to finalize the physiological benefits of, of sleep, uh, you've also talked about the uh, kind of the cleansing of the brain from uh, beta amyloid proteins, which could be cause of uh, Alzheimer's, uh, other kinds of things by the cerebral cort cortical fluid kind of bathing that. Is that, is that a, a, a kind of a generalization or do you know that? No, we now know that, and there's been more and more studies replicating that, and we're really confident now. While you're sleeping, the cells in the brain actually shrink a little bit. Um, and when they do that, they open up a lot more space around them. Okay. And that allows the cerebral spinal fluid, which really bathes all the cells uh, in the brain and the spinal cord, it gives it a lot more room and you get more motion uh, of that fluid. And the studies have been done and show that you get actual washing out of these beta amyloid complexes that are indeed um, hypothesized to be a major contributor to the development of Alzheimer's disease. And might, that, might that mean because I spent so much time reading your book and learning so much that I have a higher percentage of maybe getting Alzheimer's because I missed sleep the last couple of nights? Not a couple of nights, no. If you read kidding. my book compellingly every night for the next five years, <laughs> that might do it. Okay, I'm not doing it anymore. <laughs> but, but it's been shown that your amyloid content will be lower in the morning than it was the night before, if and only if you've slept. And there's now a study out uh, that came out in science, I think almost two years ago now, that shows that that increased flow happens during slow wave sleep. Mm. And it actually happens in a pulsatile way that's timed to the actual slow oscillation. So these slow oscillations are going at about 0.5 to one per second. So they, la they take about one or two seconds to happen. And you can actually, in fMRI, see the pulses lining up with that actual uh, oh. electrical activity in the brain. So the brain is pumping it out. Another important function we're discovering for sleep is that it seems to be involved in the regulation of insulin. When people are sleep deprived for a couple of nights or put on four hours of sleep a night for four or five nights, they start to look pre-diabetic. Their regulation of insulin goes off and it leads to um, an increase in weight. Uh, it leads to more eating because the insulin regulation is off. And Ed Van Cotter at the University of Chicago has hypothesized that in fact, much of the epidemic of obesity that we have, not just in the US, but around the world, is not just caused by um, the food we're eating, but the lack of sleep that we're slowly building up. We know that uh, when animals are sleep deprived, they will die probably sooner than they would be by food de de uh, 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 um, depletion. Um, and there are you know, world records of humans uh, staying awake for 11 days or whatever, but that Guinness Book of Records I read in your book has been canceled because that's really dangerous. Um, so how, how do you, uh, what are the, the drivers that if we are significantly sleep deprived, we can actually die? We don't know the answer to that question. And it's a fascinating one because it's been probably close to 40 to 50 years since it was first really cleanly shown with rats that if they are sleep deprived, they will die, all of them within one to two weeks. And they've spent 40 to 50 years trying to figure out why they die. And we don't know. Mm. They tend to get uh, infections. It might be some kind of sepsis, but that doesn't seem to be able to explain it all. Mm. So it really is one of those remaining mysteries of sleep. Bob, I'm really looking forward to talking about dreams. I loved your book, When Brains Dream, Exploring the Science and Mystery of Sleep, which largely focused on 
on dreams. So let, let's begin with uh, kind of a history of dreams. And just from my perspective as, a, as an amateur, uh, at, at one extreme, dreams have been the word of God. Uh, Joseph with fa interpreting Pharaoh's dreams, <clears throat> Daniel's prophecies about world empires and, and Babylonian dreams. The other, the other extreme, you have some scientists, and I must say I've been sort of in that group thinking that dreams are an epiphenomena. They seem like they're doing something, but they're, they're really the results of <clears throat> other uh, kind of processes in, in, the, um, in the brain going on, the house cleaning effects that you have these firings going on that trigger thoughts and we, we impute meaning to them where there's absolutely none. Then of course you have Freud who gives all these uh, the psychological and, uh, and uh, psychosexual meanings to dream kind of orthogonal. So you have these vast, Extreme. So give, give me a sense of, of, of your approach to the history of, of understanding dreams. Well, you know, the, the interpretation of dreams goes back to the earliest recorded stories uh, in the world, the, the Epic of Gilgamesh from 4000 BC, which is just filled with these dreams that usually his mother Freud would like that, his mother interprets, but they're always messages from the gods. And so for thousands of years, that was the main interpretation of dreams, that there were messages from the gods because they clearly feel like messages and they've gotta be coming from somewhere and where could they come from, but from the gods. And so that was, that was the idea until probably getting into the 1800s. Yeah. And in the 1800s, in the 50, years before Freud, researchers actually started studying dreams. Um, the French, the British, some American researchers uh, did really superb research uh, on dreaming. And what they seem to say is that dreams, well, not so much function, but mechanism of construction is that they took things from our memories and, and they found things related to those memories and they built stories out of them. And they didn't talk much about function. So back when it was the gods, the function was that's how gods talked to us. The function of the dream was to transmit that message. Um, for much of the 1800s, they didn't have much to say about function until the very end, literally until 1900, when Freud came out with his interpretation of dreams. And then Freud, did two things. He talked about where dreams came from, which was from our repressed desires. And then he talked about the function of dreams. And what very few people know is that Freud thought that the reason we dreamed was to keep us from waking up. That the function of a dream was to take this repressed desire, my intense desire to sleep with my mother, which I never knew I had, but Freud assures me I had. And when you're asleep, our ability to sort of suppress these desires is weakened, says Freud, and they start to leak into our conscious mind. And so our, our conscious mind frantically tries to cover up that desire by, by changing the dream, by that changing the desire from my wanting to sleep with my mother to my wanting to go exploring in a cave or something like that, so that it wouldn't be so upsetting to me that it woke me up. But the main function of dream construction was to suppress that, um, that illicit desire enough to keep me from falling asleep. And that view became dominant in Western culture and it was dominant um, right up into the 1970s when Alan Hobson, who was a neurophysiologist studying sleep at Harvard, um, came up along with Bob McCarley with his activation synthesis model. And that's the model that said that dreams are initiated by the random firing of these giant neurons in the brainstem and this activity goes up and it hits our visual cortex and the brain has no idea what it means. And as he put it, the brain then tries to make any sense it can out of this nonsense. And that becomes the dream. And so there developed this concept, which really has spread through a good part of the culture, 
that dreams are just random noise, that they don't have any real meaning. And it's interesting that Hobson actually never believed that. He believes that about what initiated the dream, that's the activation part. But the synthesis part of dreaming, he actually is very psychodynamic. He actually believes that your brain looks at your memories and, and finds things of importance and, and builds your dreams from those. But he never talks about that half. And so we end up with this new cultural belief that dreams are random, um, no intentional content, and hence meaningless. And that, that really stuck in the craw of almost all dream researchers. I remember when I first read Hobson's paper, I said to myself, either this guy has never remembered one of his dreams or else he doesn't know what the word random means. Because we all know that our dreams aren't random. I mean, they aren't just like the, this fuzzy static that we used to get on our TV screens if it was just random noise in our visual system. They're well-formed images. They're built into coherent stories. The stories feel meaningful, they feel related to our lives. And so they obviously are more than just random nonsense. And so there's been this growing belief that somehow these dreams allow the brain to do some kind of reevaluation of the recent past or some uh, planning for the future or some consideration of future possibilities. And this is what's been referred to as the cognitive model of dreaming, which is also an affective emotional model because another thing that's clear about our dreams is A, we dream about things in our lives that are emotionally salient to us when we're awake, and B, that the dreamers themselves have often have very high emotions uh, within their structure. Let's talk about the content of dreams now. Um, so gi give me a, a sort of a broad view of, of, of some of the content categories that the vast majority of our dreams would fit in, uh, you know, whether it's five, six, ten, ju just the kinds of, of, of specific, um, the, the kinds of general content in which any specific dream I, I have can be, um, can be put into. Okay, so we'll start by talking about the form of dreams. Dreams, except those very, very brief ones that we have at sleep onset, dreams are narratives, they're stories. It's not a PowerPoint presentation. It's not a static picture. It's not a series of unrelated photographs. It is a story that evolves over time that we participate in, so they're narrative. We're in the middle of the story. We're embodied in the story. It's hallucinatory. We see it. We hear it, we feel it, sometimes we smell or taste it, although not very often. And we move, we move into our dreams. So all of those are sort of what Alan Hobson would call the formal properties of dreams. Um, and they're hyper emotional. That's another characteristic. And then when you start to look at the actual content, they're usually populated with people. Uh, we are very rarely alone in a dream. And if we are alone in a dream, we're usually aware of the fact that other people are missing. Mm -hmm. It usually happens in, a, um, in an environment, in a, in a scene that feels familiar, but actually isn't. When we wake up and look back at it, we usually can't say, oh, that, that's, that's my bedroom where I lived when I grew up. In the dream, we might think it's that bedroom, but when we wake up, we say, no, it didn't look anything like that. Um, we're delusional through all of this. That's another formal characteristic. We actually believe that this is happening in real life, that we're not dreaming, despite all the cues that we get that it couldn't possibly be true. But there's people in it, there's interactions, there's emotional emotions. The interactions and the emotions tend to be more negative and positive, but not by a large margin. Um, we don't do a lot of rational thinking. We don't seem to have a lot of personal control over what's happening in the dream. Um, but it tends to be stories that feel relevant to our ongoing life. They can involve people who were having 
problems with or having good times with. It can involve activities that we're engaged in while we're waking. Interestingly, we don't dream about typing or Zooming or Skyping or watching YouTube. We don't dream about reading books. We don't dream about writing. These things that most of us spend most of our time doing during the day don't have any role at all in our dreams. They tend to be stories about things that feel important to us. Let me tell you one of my most um, vivid dreams that I, that I had. I'm going to give you the background, and you're going to be my, my Sigmund Freud. So uh, I was running a company, this was 20 years ago, uh, about 50 miles from where I lived. So every day I had to drive 50 miles on the expressway, the freeway. So now, so that was, that's the setting, and here, here's the dream I had. A friend is suddenly sick at, from the company and asked that I take him home on his motorcycle. Now, I've never driven a motorcycle at all. Um, and he tells me that I'm going to have to drive because he can't drive the motorcycle. And it's about an hour uh, on the freeway to, to his home. I tell him in the dream, I said, I don't even have a helmet. And he said, no, you don't need a helmet uh, because there's a second passenger who's going to also be sitting with me on the motorcycle. So now I'm sort of in a, 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 a I'm saying, can at least I use the surface streets? Because maybe then if I have an accident, I, I won't get, we won't get as hurt. He said, no, 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 no. You have to use the freeway. And I, then I, I, I remember this so soon. And I said, what is the slowest speed that I can drive on the freeway? What's the slowest? What's, he said, 50 miles an hour. And, I, and then I said, I'm not going to do it. I'm just not going to do this. And then suddenly, all at once, about 15 or 20 people, all from my company, surround me and tell me I have to do it. There's no, they're, they're going to insist that I drive him on this motorcycle without a helmet. And I feel myself pressured and, and almost willing to give in. But then finally, I feel myself resisting and say, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna call Uber and buy everybody in this crowd a free ride home. Now, <laughs> I, I, I'm smart enough to know that I shouldn't drive that motorcycle but I'm not smart enough to know that I'm dreaming and this is all nonsense. Well, I have to start by giving you the answer I give everybody who comes up to me and says, here's a dream, tell me what it means. I always say, Robert, you are one sick cookie. <laughs> that's my standard response. That's no, and then, that's no revelation. <laughs> yes, and, and then when their, their face starts to crumble, I laugh and I say, I have no idea what it means to you, and I'm not sure it even has a meaning. So if I was to play Freud, which I hate doing, I would say, okay, someone is asking you to take control and to move fast and to get something done that you know, A, you don't know how to do, and B, is dangerous. Okay. Feel like most of your life? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'm going to tell you one more, and this is a shorter one. Uh, so I'm in a taxi, and Vladimir Putin is the taxi driver. And I'm sitting in the back seat, and I really want to talk to him, and he seems like he wants to talk to me. And so as we begin a conversation, every time he talks to me, he looks back to me. And I'm now in this panic of which one is more important, the opportunity to talk to Vladimir Putin and really understand what he says, or the fact that his eyes are not on the road. <laughs> and I finally decide to say, please don't look at me, look at the road. But again, I have no idea that I'm in the dream. And again, I really have no idea. I mean, so I'm gonna give a quick guess and then I'm gonna ask you a couple of questions, okay? Because that's the real way to do it. So the quick guess again, is you're put in a situation where you have an opportunity to get information, um, maybe related to a show you want to do, maybe not. I'm sure you're not thinking of it that way. But here's a man you would love to get information from. And there's a risk associated with it. And how do you balance the risk of crashing mm -hmm. against the, the, the positive aspects of getting this information? So that's my, you know, that's my real facts. Right. Yes, but let me ask you a question. You can send me a bill. Don't forget yeah. to send me a bill for okay. the, the uh, psychoanalytic services. 
Well, if it's psychoanalytic, it's going to be really expensive. But, but not, so let me ask you, when you woke up, what did it feel the dream was about? Um, I, you know, I, I don't have that recollection. I've, I've, I remembered this dream so often that I, it's hard to discern the, the experience of when I actually had it from when I've rethought about it over the years. Okay, so uh, now, what does it feel like? Is it an anxiety dream? Are you scared or is it an opportunity well, dream? The, the first one with the motorcycle is definitely an anxiety. Uh, at one point in my life, I wanted to, I thought I might, before I could afford a car, I thought I might buy a motorcycle. I went down, I sat on one, and I said, I'm never going to do this, never. <laughs> That's as close as I came. Um, but I, I rem I, the, the emotion I had during that dream has lasted my whole life. Maybe it was you know, 20 or 25 years ago, I don't remember. But that emotion of being pressured to go on that motorcycle without a helmet um, and, and, and drive fast and knowing it was a mistake, but feeling myself being surrounded by people pressuring me that, that that emotion has 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 lasted, and you know I'm I'm pleased in the dream that I resisted, and I came up with this uh, magnanimous way of paying everybody's Uber as as this big very clever. But let me ask you, do you feel pressured by your coworkers to to do things that you feel are dangerous, to to try new things, to go in new directions that they want you to go in, and you resist? Yeah, normally it's the opposite. Uh, I, I want to go in a new direction. Everybody says I'm not, so um, <laughs> I, I, I'm I'm not sure. So, um, look, let's 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 go on um, and now move to um, uh, the different categories of explanations of, of dreams. You've actually listed listed some in your book. The, the different ways of, of 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 explaining dreams as an evolutionary function, or as you said, dreams have zero ab adaptivity or biological function. The opposite. Uh, dreams help us uh, solve problems or play a role in emotional regulation related to REM sleep. I mean, those are the categories you, you've talked about. So how to begin to look at each of those categories and then later we'll get to what, what you think the answer is. From a research perspective, dreams are horrifically difficult to study. And they're difficult for two or three reasons. One reason is it's always plagued with the question of are we talking about what a dream does, the function of a dream, or are we talking about the brain activity that happens to produce this, um, this dream as a side effect, as an epiphenomenon. Uh, to, to give you a sense of what that means, uh, a, a cardiologist will put a stethoscope on your chest and listen to your heartbeat and tell you that you have this kind of a problem or that kind of a problem or that you have a clean bill of health, that heartbeat is just an epiphenomenon. The brain didn't evolve with an intention to make a sound that a cardiologist could interpret. The brain, the evolution produced a pump. And if you got a pump, it's going to make a noise every time it pumps. And That's we have heart. found a use for it. So, so we never know with dreams, is there some basic brain process going on? that serves a function or is it actually the dream that's doing something so the fun fundamental difference yes yes so we do something so so that's one problem problem number two is it's very hard to experimentally manipulate someone's dreams and even when we can we don't know whether the impact of that is through the person dreaming having the phenomenological experience of dreaming, or whether it's just the brain activity that's being induced that we know must be producing uh, that dream. And so we're always sort of stuck with these caveats when we talk about you know, what dreaming is doing. Um, so then when we come back and we ask, well, what is it doing? Is it doing emotion regulation? Um, so we can look at dream content, Ross Cartwright, back in the last century did these wonderful studies um, with women who had just gone through divorce. And she collected their dream reports from REM sleep. And then she looked and asked, OK, how often do their ex-spouses appear in the dream? And in what role? In, in which dreams do, does the woman take a more dominant 
uh, role in relationship to their ex-spouse and in which dreams is the ex-spouse domineering in the dream. And she found that insofar as the women were dominant in their dreams with their ex-spouses, if you look six months out, they were less likely to be depressed. Mm. And so she argued that these dreams, when they succeeded, when they managed to portray the, the, the recently divorced woman in a positive and powerful relationship with her ex-husband, that that was causally related to preventing them from developing depression. Now, you have to take a step back as a scientist and say, all we have is correlation. We don't have causation. We don't have a way to make half the women have those dreams and the other half not have those dreams so we can try to look at causality. But those are the sort of arguments that say that dreams are in fact uh, involved in emotional regulation. And we know in fact that we dream about things that are emotionally distressing to us, but also things that are emotionally exciting to us. And we know that our mood tends to be more regulated in the morning than it was the night before. So something during sleep is serving that regulatory function. Um, and why not have it be dreams? So again, it, it's a little soft from a scientific perspective because as you know, when we try to study consciousness, uh, it's a real hard nut to crack because we can't isolate the conscious phenomenology from the underlying brain function, brain activity. Okay, you have uh, posed your own theory of the acronym NEXT UP, Network Exploration to Understand Possibilities, um, as a new theory that um, you said opens our minds to unexplored possibilities. Uh, that sounds like a very specific kind of, um, of, of purpose of dream. So I'd like to have you describe it and then go into it in some depth, including experimental evidence. Okay. So the idea is when we're asleep, we know that our brain is doing massive amounts of memory processing. And most of that memory processing, if we analyze it, if we ask what is the impact of the sleep on those memories, we, we describe it as, as convergent thinking processes. That is to say, it takes a bunch of information and tries to come and find the central meaning of it. It tries to find the gist of it and extract the gist. Or it tries to take word pairs that we have memorized the night before and strengthen our memory so in the morning we're better able to remember the second word in the pair when we're given the first word. They're very goal-oriented in a very specific kind of a way. And that's important and that's very helpful to the organism. It makes the organism better prepared to face the world the next morning because it has this extracted meaning in some cases and this increased strength of the memories and this better ability to perform tasks as a result of sleeping. There's this nice phrase, um, memories about the future, not about the past uh, that, you, that you have in the book. That's right. And that actually comes from Dan Schachter, who said that we tend to think of memories as being about the past. You know, when we get older and we're in our rocking chair, we can say, remember, remember when we were younger and we did this or that. But, but that's not why memories evolved. Memories evolved so that when we find ourselves in a situation in the future that we've lived through in the past, or that's similar to something we've lived through in the past, we can learn from our mistakes. Mm. And that's what memory is about, so that we don't repeat failed patterns, so that we can take knowledge that we've accrued in our memories to project and predict what kind of behavior will be most successful in the future. This now, is very consistent with a, a kind of a, a recent theory of brain function in general, that the brain is a predictive organ. And you can do, uh, there's been a lot of work showing in, in, in sensory work between afferent and efferent fibers that the brain is imposing ideas on sensation. Uh, and the underlying uh, 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 theory is that this is a predictive, the brain is always predicting something and then matching the reality against the prediction and then modifying its prediction. So 
if that's a, a core kind of fundamental approach to the brain, then what you're saying in memory is very consistent with that. Right, but notice that we're working over huge scales of time. So the brain sends a signal to a motor afferent to cause a muscle to contract. It gets feedback from a proprio receptor to say how much the, the, the limb, for example, has moved. It says, that's not what I meant to happen. And so next time it wants to create emotion, it'll send a stronger impulse. And all of that is happening almost on the millisecond basis. And the same with the visual system, with all our sensory systems. So it's, it's doing this fine tuning so that it can predict what's really happening in the outer world more and more accurately. And it's doing it on a, a fraction of a second basis. And then we have the kind of overnight processing of memories that, that I've been talking about mostly for the last 20 years, which is non-conscious, not dream-related memory processing. And that's working on a scale of hours, right? Mm -hmm. I'm going to be better at this in the morning yeah. than I was the night before. But it is something that the brain has identified, and we can talk about this more, that the brain has said, you know what? In the, in the near future, hours to days, this information would be valuable if I could make it more predictive, if I could be better able to predict which card is gonna get turned over in the deck next. So, so that's on that scale. When we're dreaming, we're really talking longer scale. So I sometimes say dreaming is a venture capitalist. <laughs> It's investing our time and its resources in all sorts of possibilities, most of which might not pay off. You know, venture capitalists, we, we say that if, a venture, if half of the investments of a venture capitalist turn a profit, they're not a venture capitalist. For sure. They're looking for 10% of their investments turning a thousand percent profit, and sure. then they're happy. So when we dream, our brain does something very different from what it's doing in the non-conscious memory processing during the night. It looks for strangely weak associations. So something happens in your day. Um, I'm driving home from work. I live in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Some jerk runs a stop sign and almost crashes into me. I have to swerve into oncoming traffic to avoid being hit. Fortunately, there's a break in traffic. I get around fine. You know, I make it home safely. I tell Debbie, my wife, I'm going to take that job in Iowa. I'm done driving in, in Boston. That night, I have a dream. And in my dream, I'm at the amusement park with my son, Adam. And he's five years old. And we're on the bumper cars. And he's driving the bumper car. And he's crashing into everybody he can. And everybody else is crashing into him. And he's laughing and laughing. And I'm sitting there saying, I don't want to be here. This is not fun. Hmm. Now, I don't remember about the near accident I was in yesterday. That doesn't come to my mind because in REM sleep specifically, outflow from the hippocampus is shut off. So we can't reactivate actual memories from the day before. Um, and I certainly don't replay that memory which the brain is going to do for me as soon as I wake up. And so I wake up and I laugh and I said, oh, I just had a dream about that accident I was almost in. And if I want to, I can stop and say, what the hell was my brain doing? I mean, those are totally different situations. I mean, one was really dangerous. The other one wasn't really dangerous at all. And if I think about it, maybe I say, well, actually, you know, the car coming through the stop sign wasn't as dangerous as it felt at the time, was it? I mean, if he had hit me, it would have been an insurance claim. You know, I might have need to go, have needed to go to the chiropractor. He wasn't going fast enough that he would have flipped my car or hurt me seriously. It was just scary. So one could argue that the brain wasn't trying to give me that message. It was saying, okay, you had this really upsetting event during the day. Let's find things that seem related to it. 
What's related to it? And one of the things it comes up with is bumper cars in the amusement park. Mm -hmm. And it puts me into that scenario and it runs me through it and it watches, my brain watches me, the character, react to it and get all upset. And my brain looks at that level of, of upset and says, okay, this is valuable. This is important because he's reacting strongly to it. I'm going to connect it to what happened during the day. I'm literally going to strengthen the synaptic connections between nerve cells that go from the event of the day through my associative networks to being at the amusement park so that when I'm awake tomorrow, even if I don't wake up and remember the dream, those connections will be stronger. And if I think about the accident, I might say, although it really wasn't that dangerous and have no idea why I'm saying that because I don't remember having the dream. Exploring and then strengthening weak associations is, is I think the key element of the, the next uh, theory that, that you have, network exploration to understand possibilities. Now you have a priming experiment, which is very specific in showing how weak associations are strengthened in dreams. And in, in, in my knowledge, that, 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 is, that, that seemed to be one of the most powerful experiments. All, all the other theory is great. I love to hear it and stories, but that experiment is, 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 is uh, counterintuitive and unexpected. And, and, the, and the results seem to be extremely significant. Yes, so this is a wonderful old cognitive psychology test. Um, I'm gonna flash a word on a screen, maybe the word wrong, and half the time I'll flash a word and half the time I'll flash a non-word. It might put up W-R-O-N-K instead of W-R-O-N-G. And then when that comes up, I say, press one of two buttons. It's a word, it's not a word. Do it as quickly as accurate and as accurately as you can. And then the trick of the study is that before each of these words, a quarter second before that word pops up, I flash another word on the screen. So I might put up the word fox and then wrong and see how long it takes you to respond to the word wrong. Or I might put up the word thief and then wrong. Or I might put up right and then wrong. And if I put up right and then wrong, you will correctly identify wrong as a word faster than if I go thief wrong. And if I go thief wrong, you'll go faster than if I put up mop wrong. So we can take an unrelated word prime and look at how much faster a weak associate and a strong associate makes the brain. And we're literally seeing how when you see a word like thief or wrong or even mop, your brain automatically starts activating associated words in your brain as if it's getting ready to hear this next word. So I can say, here we go, Robert, right, wrong, fast, slow, high, low, fat, and your brain just wants to say thin. It, right. It's like it's, it's activated automatically. And so by looking at how much faster you go, you know how strong those connections are at the moment. And I say at the moment because when you wake someone up from REM sleep and run them through these, these word pairs, this priming task, and we can get them through 50 of these primes in just two minutes while they're still waking up we find that they respond to thief wrong faster than they do to right wrong. All of a sudden, the weak, the normally weak associates seem to be more strongly connected. So when you're in REM sleep, your brain is going to preferentially be following those weaker pathways. That's an amazing result. It and, is. And it, right. it, really, it's the the core experimental uh, uh, evidence for your, your theory. When I first read the theory, I said, oh, that's nice. And 
you know, I, I know a thousand other theories that maybe thought, I thought were nicer, but that experiment, you know, uh, uh, shocked me. Uh, so and, that, that, that was a great one. And what's interesting about it historically is that we use that task because that's the result you see with schizophrenia patients. Mm. Schizophrenia patients are notorious for being hyper-associative. You start them talking and they're just all over their place. They can't, they don't seem to be able to follow a, a straight line of conversation if you just let them talk. They'll just go, oh, I was talking to my mother, uh, which rhymes with brother, and I haven't seen my brother in months, and that reminds me of lunch. And they'll just keep going off all these different tangents. So we thought there's something about this schizophrenic brain that allows it or causes it to preferentially follow these weak associations. And of course, we know from our, looking at our dreams that we have all these bizarre events happening in our dreams. Bob, what I want to do now is to give you a series of words and get your immediate association with each one in terms of, of dreams and make it each one very short. I want to get your association. So let, let me just start and give, and give me a sentence or two on each. And I'm just going to go through the list. Okay. okay. Start. Bizarre dreams. Our dreams are incredibly bizarre. They are not like completely irrational. There's always some sort of logical connection there. It's just not one we'd expect to see. Nightmares. We don't know whether nightmares are a successful use of dreams or whether it's a dysfunction of dreaming. It might be that they let us process those bad memories more effectively. Do children dream? Children's dreams are a lot more about animals than ours are as adults. They seem to have a somewhat simpler form, um, but they can be equally emotional, equally distressing, and equally exciting. Do animals dream? If they're conscious, they probably dream. Lucid dreams, where you're in a dream and you know you're in a dream and you can uh, manipulate it in, in some way. Uh, I, I, I would like to do that. I never have. I know you have some instructions. I may try it. Lucid dreaming is actually just being aware of the fact that you're in a dream. It doesn't necessarily require that you're able to change the content of the dream. Most people will report that they've had one or two lucid dreams in their lives. There are some who have them every month and a small number who have them every week or even every night. The ability to control what happens in the dream is difficult because when you're in a lucid dream, you're sitting on a knife edge and on one side is waking up mm. and the other side is losing lucidity. So you first have to learn how to navigate to stay on that edge. And if you can do that, then you can start playing with manipulating content. Interestingly, everybody's first choice is not sex with a movie star, it's mm. flying. Okay. Uh, the relationship between dreaming and LSD experiences and the sort of the acid awareness that people have talked about. One of the strangest things that bothered me for years about dreams is this phenomenon that everybody thinks their dreams are really fascinating and exciting and important and they really want to tell me. When I go to parties, I don't tell people I'd study dreams anymore because if I do, the next seven words out of their mouths are, oh, I had the most amazing dream. And then they tell me a totally unamazing, in fact, boring dream. So what is it across thousands of years, across every culture we have ever looked into? Why does everybody think their dreams are important? The only place I know that that happens outside of dreaming is in people who take LSD. And as someone who lived through the 60s, 1960s, I can tell you that we called these acid insights. And I remember someone saying to me, I wrote it down this time because I, I never remember it correctly. And here's what I, this, here's my insight. When you flush the toilet, everything 
underline, 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 goes down. <laughs> and he paused and he said, no, it, it, meant, it, 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 it meant more than that. It really explained everything. <laughs> and what I realized is that when you're in REM sleep, we know that the release of noradrenaline, norepinephrine is shut off in the brain completely. And we know that that will loosen our associative networks because of course, when your adrenaline is high, you're amazingly focused. And if you can get rid of that, it allows your mind to wander. Uh, but serotonin release is also shut off. Reason for that, we haven't had any good explanation for. But LSD is a serotonin um, mimicker. In some parts of the brain, it actually causes more serotonin release. In other parts, it shuts off serotonin release. And my clinical use of dreams. Okay, sorry. No. Um, let me say one more sentence about the other thing and I'll make it really fast. I think the shut off of serotonin release in the brain during REM sleep is a mechanism the dream, that the dreaming brain has to make us think our dreams are important even when they're not, to bias us towards assigning value to these weak associations that we would otherwise just reject. Very good. Clinical use of dreams. I'm not sure what the clinical use of dreams are. We can use various techniques to work with people who have nightmares. We can try to work with people who have PTSD and these repetitive nightmares. Um, I'm not so sure that we can do more with dreams except use them uh, in sort of a talking therapy to help us gain some insight in, into our psyche and, and our our deep thoughts and beliefs. Telepathic and precognitive dreams, uh, so-called ESP through dreams. I think the ESP of dreams is, is part of that, that serotonergic shutdown telling us that things are important, whether they are or not. I think we see lots of coincidences in our lives and assign meaning to them. And when we dream them, we assign more meaning. But beyond that, when we dream, our brain lets us look at things that we've learned that we didn't pay attention to. Someone has a dream that their father dies and then gets a call in the morning. And in fact, their father has died. And she tells me, but the day before I had talked to him and he was incredibly healthy. In fact, he said he played the best set of tennis in his life. He played so hard, his shoulder ached all afternoon. And I said to her, did you know that an aching shoulder is a sign of a potential heart attack? And she looked at me and said, no. But I suspect somewhere hidden in her brain was that information that she had learned and filed away. And it took her dreaming brain mm. to find the association and play it out. So sometimes our dreams do predict the future because the brain is, after all, a prediction machine. Folk wisdom has uh, creativity and insights coming from dreams. And I know from my dreams, I've, you know, with all the thousands of new ideas that I've had, none of them were really any good. <laughs> we know that there are cases where dreams have provided profound insight. We have two or three Nobel laureates who ascribe their, um, their award to insights they gained from dreams, again, dreams that they recall that we don't recall more than about 5% of them. But Salvador Dali had a technique for using sleep onset hypnagogic dreams uh, to get images for his paintings. Uh, Thomas Edison would sit in a chair, an armchair with his hand extended holding a spoon over a metal plate and he would sit there and close his eyes and think about a block he had towards solving some problem in an invention he was trying to construct, invent. And as he fell asleep, the muscle tone in his fingers would relax, the spoon would fall and hit the plate, wake him up. And he said he would reliably wake up with an insight 
into um, the problem he was trying to solve. This is the sleep onset period for both of them. Might have been sleep onset for some of those Nobel laureates as well. That's a time that seems to let us uh, be particularly creative in discovering specific solutions to specific problems. Um, late night REM dreams, the dreams you remember when you wake up in the morning, don't seem to work that well. It's a hard experiment to do. Well, I'll try my best. I know your, your book is terrific, has a lot of advice about how to do this. I will try and, and hopefully before another 10 years, we'll get together and, uh, and, and take another look at sleep and dreams. Well, I look forward to it. In the meantime, sleep on everything I've told you. Thank you for watching. If you like this video, please like and comment below. You can support Closer to Truth by subscribing.